Hey everybody, welcome to another show on the Comic Art Live channel. We got another auction preview tonight. Tonight I'm joined by Micah from Comic Connect. And uh, as everybody who went to OAX knows, Micah was there hanging out, having a really good time. And uh, so I'm sure we'll get to hear a little bit about uh, Comic Connect's experiences at the show as well. So let's just dive into this thing. I know we have a lot of uh, a lot of artwork to look at and uh, we got Micah in the green room. Hey Micah. Hello. Hello. Nice to have you back. Nice to be back. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, this is the first time we've talked since LAX. Yes, I, we've I, emailed, but we have not spoken about the show, really. So That's true. I hope that you uh, took some time off. I have not. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, though. So, you know, I got it. We. It's like we're hitting the ground running and just never stopping. So you know, that's okay. But. Uh, I, you know, the other day I was talking to some, I'm almost caught up with my email. <laughs> so that's, that's the beauty. Uh, you know, that the happy point is when I'll actually um, have everything, everybody replied to after the show, but, but yeah, no, no, it's been good. We've, um, you know, no, it, it's, I'm, I mean, for a show, for a first year show, uh, I think it was exceptional. It was, it was so, it was a lot of fun. It was everything it should have been. It was, uh, it was, it was, the, the, the Collectors were fun. The show was fun. The artists were fun. The whole experience was great. It was busy. It was so busy that I never got to see the whole room. And uh, I mean, there are worse problems to have. Mm -hmm. Sat the Saturday of the show, I did not leave our booth at all. At no point, because food was delivered to us. Thank you. That was the idea. <laughs> uh, and and there were and there was constantly people chatting and. Uh, you know, it was just, it was, it was, it was great. As being in a room of art collectors is a pleasurable experience by and large, more, more so than I can say about most comic book conventions. Well, you've been to a, you, you, you know, I know we've both been to many, many, many shows that are just comic focused or pop culture focused. And yeah, mm -hmm. no, oh yeah, it's definitely, even though I didn't get to really experience it or enjoy it as well, it stood <laughs> out as something that you could tell was like what we've all wanted to. Uh, what we yeah, need to do, you great. need to build you need to build it up and that make the show a big success and then sell it to somebody and then you can just go for fun. <laughs> that would be uh well the go for fun part. I don't know about selling it, but yeah, I mean nobody <laughs> probably want to buy it, but uh, but no, it, it, I, I totally get it. It was fun because we did have a lot of people document the show, so I got to see a lot of videos afterwards. And yeah, and, and I talked was, to people who who people who didn't make it, who really, really wished they had. Why and didn't they go? I, I mean, a couple people who couldn't make it for good reason. But still, you know, it's a, you, you, you want to have a show where the people who didn't go are jealous. Even if they couldn't go for... So these like people a, that, you, really that you know about, that they, were they are jealous? Is that what you're saying? Yeah? Yeah. No, but, I mean, jealous is a strong word, but I mean... You know, right. just they, they, there's the definitely people who feel like they missed on something by not being at the first one. Well, why didn't they go in the first place? It was just well. Uh, I mean, some people had, you know, things they couldn't get out of. Uh, so a couple people I talked to had uh, health health issues that prevented them from going. Uh, you know, unexpected, mm -hmm. you know, injuries. I know two people. I talked to two people who had plans to go and had tickets to go, and then thing you know health comes up and you know your plans change your priorities change but uh but they, you know they both plan on being there next year so well, I, I, assume, that... I assume next year is not a a maybe at this point oh no no we've got the dates we've signed the contract it's going to be the weekend of the 24th through the 26th still in january still in january uh there's reasons why we might look to moving it for 2020 uh six but for 2025 it's going to stay um pretty much right where it's at yeah i, mean, I think it's perfect if you you know who wouldn't want to go to florida for a weekend in january <laughs> that was that was the idea going in right it, you know the yeah. just wanting uh everybody wants a vacation and you know it is something that you can do once a year and not feel too guilty about you know i mean at the, in the winter time doing that it's Absolutely. like Going to, I'd go to Vegas once a year if I could. Uh, so Orlando, you know, in the uh, winter time, it's good. It's all good. But yeah, you know, I'm glad it worked out well for you guys. I, I remember when we talked, you had you had said that 
uh, you know, you guys have picked up a few pieces, you sold a few things that would have been like in the, the marketplace that you picked up some consignment. So it seemed to kind of hit on all the, all the areas that a, you know, an auction house would want to have uh, work out for them. You know, you, you did all the things that you wanted and I'll be honest, every, you know, I saw plenty of photographs and videos from the show and every time you guys were kind of in the back, I always saw like three or four people at the booth talking with you. So I can see why there wasn't really any downtime, especially on Saturday for you. Yeah, and, and it's even Sunday, which that wasn't as crowded as Saturday, but that's to be expected. And but it was still busy. It was you know it, it was still a lot to do. And I you know I walked around a little bit on Sunday, but not so much that I got to see the whole room. I would have liked to. There are people there that I never got to talk to. Yeah, <laughs> I get it. I get it. It's almost like a two day show, or at least a seven hours a day show is not really. Enough, but the thing is, you know, that was why we wanted it that way because it gave, gave people a lot of time to socialize after the show. They yeah. could have breakfast, and you know, before the show. There was Friday night. Um, you know, I know, you know, you know what I mean. That was we were trying to give people those those opportunities no, I, to uh, to do things. No, no, no real complaints. Nothing. Uh, it's good. Nothing to complain about. The party on Friday was fun. Uh, yeah, nothing, nothing to complain about. That's what we like to hear. Hopefully, uh, my only, the only thing is I wish we had the plans to come back Monday instead of Sunday night because that was a little bit of a mm. of, of a lot cramming in a lot. But, you know, you do what you do. Right. Well, ask, you know, try to get that uh, Monday morning flight because it's yeah. it, you know, Sunday. Sunday was fun, too, because, you know, a lot of people just hung out at the bar and BS and it was a good way to kind of decompress after the show was over. And um we didn't leave till Monday afternoon and but I, I still saw a lot of people, you know, who were there who went to the parks on Monday who were just checking out of the hotel, you yep. know, three or four o'clock. But a leaving on Sunday night allowed me to watch Vince yelling to himself on the plane, watching the football game, <laughs> like yelling out loud <laughs> during the game. That was the neat game where the 49ers beat the Lions and, and the whole entire world, except for the city of San Francisco was rooting for Detroit. That's true. <laughs> and, and, and Vince is on the plane going, like, no! <laughs> and, and then apologizing to everybody. It was fun. Nice. Well, I, I can see Vincent doing that on a plane. But, yes. So, yeah. No, OAX was great. Looking forward to the next one already. Good. No, it's, uh, yeah, we've got a, we've got some stuff we're working on right now. I think we'll be making announcements in the next, uh, you know, month as far as uh, getting the hotel uh, link out there for people because people are already wanting to book to make sure they don't have any issues with rooms next year. And, um, yeah. you know, now that we've got the agreement all inked with them, we'll be rolling that out. I think we'll probably be starting ticket sales, uh, you know, sometime, sometime soon. I don't know quite when, but, um, there's no reason, you know, kind of why not to everybody's ready for that. And I think whatever, whatever limit we set those tickets to, they will sell out before the show this year. It won't be something that happens, uh, you know, at the show, like we, like yeah. this past year. So just, uh, to comment, uh, just to answer the question in the comments, uh, that will be taken care of tomorrow. Thank you for letting me know. Ah, you can leave great. that. Yeah. You could have left that out, but that's okay. Ah, anyway, sorry. Hey, things happen. There, there was an interesting image up on on Heritage this past week. Not, you know, not to mention a competitor, but we're you know, it happens. Love, and it's love hard happens. To, there was a it's hard to police everything in an auction when you have so many pieces. But thank you for letting me know. I appreciate it. It will be fixed uh, in the morning. There you go. That's uh, yeah. There was a price tag on on a piece over at uh, at Heritage from Anthony. Ah. <laughs> One of his post-it notes right on the front. It's like it, like they left it there. So, so and I, I emailed him about it. I'm like, yeah, you might want to get this fixed. Yeah. So yeah. you know, nobody's perfect, Micah. It's just it's how it is. Don't, you see me? I, I send out at least three or four typos in every. I've looked, through, I've looked through the entire art session multiple times, and I didn't notice because it, it all you know you look at something so many times, you know you, you're not looking at it with fresh eyes. So thank you. Yeah. Corey Russ, does the hotel have connecting rooms? Yes, it does. Actually, we uh, that's how they actually handle four bedrooms or not four bedrooms, two bedroom suites are actually connected to connected rooms. It's like a regular uh, two bedroom, like two bedroom room, and then a uh, or single bedroom room plus the uh, suite. So they do they do all kinds of stuff at the hotel. I think there I are a lot of people. I didn't see your room, but I saw Cosra's, and if yours room is as nice as his, that's a nice room. 
It was <laughs> my my room was right across. Was at the other end of the hall yeah. when you got up the ele elevator. So I think next year we're going to end up having to open up both uh, penthouses, and it'll be a it's the, it'll be the CEO and the COO party. You know, it just depends on which which place you want to hang out in. I will say that that being invited up to Cosmer's room on Saturday night did keep me up too late. <laughs> some of us, some of us are there work, Bill. That is, that's true. That is very true. Well, I went to his party and I didn't even have a drink. Drink for when you get home. <laughs> oh man, but uh, but yeah, well, I'm glad I'm glad everything worked out. And of course, you know, we've got. Um, you know, before we do anything, we'll, we'll be talking to all the uh, the people who exhibited beforehand and give a first right of refusal to uh, to those exhibitors and everything. Well, so I, I can't see any reason why we wouldn't be back. Yeah, that's good to hear. That that's good to hear. Yeah, I don't think we're gonna we are getting the whole space next year though. That so we have a little bit more room, but it really isn't gonna give us a lot more room to add it. Uh, you know, if we can add like four other exhibitors, that'll be about the max. You know, right. This number is probably gonna stay about the same maybe add five more it all depends really on, 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 a, on a few things but we wanted to have a little bit more space it gives us more room for the galleries and to, so we can promote them a little bit better and uh right. yeah. i don't know i don't know that that's something i necessarily want to do every year is bring stuff oh, to have all your stuff yeah. it was a lot it was a lot more work than i thought it would be a dozen pieces yeah no i i get it it, it was uh it was nerve-wracking for us too as you can you can imagine to have all you know all that art it, just, it was yeah just for those who were there, uh, all the stuff from the office that we brought to show in the gallery space had to be unframed, and then we shipped the frames, and then reframed when we got to Florida, and then unframed before we went back, and then we had to shift the frames back again Sunday night. Uh, it was a lot. And it's stressful having to handle things that valuable. Or maybe you send less valuable things next time. So it, we could. It's it's up to you. <laughs> I, I, we've already started talking with some people about uh, you know ex things that we want to have exhibited for next year. So we're just trying to or maybe less pieces. Maybe you know maybe a, a, a handful instead of what do we bring ten or eleven? Mm -hmm. Maybe bring five, four or five. And number one, share, you know, I wanted to know how many times you got asked if the flash piece was real. <laughs> I was just so I because the, so the glass broke on the flash 123 cover the frame so um, we kept that at our booth instead of keeping it in the gallery and I was just bring I bring it up to the room every night and I was bringing it down Sunday morning and uh, somebody on the elevator was like oh did you just buy that and I was on the elevator with um, who was I on the elevator with. So another collector, I, I'm blanking on who it was at the right this second. Um, and he was like, oh, did you pick that up here? And I was like, uh, no. <laughs> and then <laughs> the, guy, the, other, the other guy I was with, it might have been uh, Tom Coker, maybe. Um, but, uh, and he was like, should, should I tell him or do you want to? <laughs> and he just looked at the guy and he was like, yeah, that's the real one. And the guy was like, no. And he was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tom had a good time on the show. It's like, ah, no, this is nothing. Don't worry about it. <laughs> that was fun. Things like that are fun, though. Of course. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we should probably get into it because not that I don't want to keep everybody up till midnight. I don't want to be on till midnight. Uh, maybe <laughs> I you don't want to be on till midnight. So, so uh, this, option, this option is a little bit different. Yep. Uh, we have art over two days. Uh, the so and the, so the first this instead of the auction starting on Monday like normal, this, we're starting with a Sunday session, starting at six o'clock Eastern on Sunday, and that is uh, mostly just it's so it's the John Burke collection. So John Burke was a huge collector. Uh, we sold uh, the majority of his collection uh, probably about seven eight years ago, and he held on to. Uh, things that were important to him or personal to him. And sadly, last uh, fall, he, he passed away. And so now we're, for his family, we're, uh, we've been entrusted to sell off the rest of the stuff. So things that he had kept. So there's some very special pieces. And those are ending 
Sunday, six o'clock Eastern. There's only, I think, 18 pieces of art, and then his comics and other other assorted ephemera. And um, but the art ends first, so the art starts 6 p.m. Sunday. It only runs only again 18 pieces or so, mm-hmm. but uh, really wonderful stuff. So the first piece is the Al Avison recreation that's up on the wall here behind me. That's uh, yeah, it's really really great. Avison doing what? Uh, uh, I can't read the uh, screen. <laughs> uh, I forget what, what, what title it is a recreation of what cover it is. Oh, it's um, I'm sorry, it's All Winners Four. All Winners, yeah, All Winners. Uh, yeah, a really great full color recreation, nicely framed. Uh, yeah, it's very very cool for Golden Age collectors, uh, of which there are still still several. Thankfully. They're, they're out there still. And the thing they is, are, they are, and they are passionate. And I, God bless them, because I love that stuff too. Well, and I would assume since he held on to this piece, it was pretty important to him. I mean, oh, yeah. No, they yeah. Have, they have it. I, I mean, it's pretty crazy. I never got to meet John. I, I wish I had. You know, there's a few people who, you know, we sadly we've lost some, some pretty big collectors in the past, you know, six months. Uh, and like, I mean, you know, between. John Burke and Roger Hill, who's another guy who I never got to meet and really wish I had. Like mm-hmm. nothing but great things I heard about him. Uh, that even just Ed Jaster just a couple weeks ago, yeah. uh, who I knew a little bit, but not not well. Uh, but yeah, and it's it's uh, sobering. So, but, the, but you know the nice you know the work in whatever, for whatever, you know, the collections live on, however that might be, either they, whether they stay together, they get dispersed, but the things exist. And it's nice having things, for me, I mean, I have things that had come out of big collector's collections, but I like that. I like having things that like a huge collector thought was worth having. Mm-hmm. You know, because you know, the bigger a collector you are, the more sort of discerning you become about the things that you buy and the things that you keep. And it's like, this was good enough for this guy to have it. And that's, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I, it could, that could mean nothing to some people. I don't know. I like it. Like, you know, for, really. underground, for like underground collectors, like I like that I have a couple of things from, from the Eric Sack collection that mm-hmm. sold like five or six years ago. Uh, like the biggest collector of underground or, or comics and comic art or one of the biggest anyway. It's like having something of his is, is nice. You know, some other things like that. that I, but anywho. Next, next, if we want to move, let's move on to the next one. This is a, this piece is extraordinary. Right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can go full screen. There we go. This right here, this was uh, in the, in, uh, I think it says in the, in the description, but it, it was in the back, in the back of an issue of Adventure Comics in 1940, they, they did a contest for like a letter writing contest. And it's like, you know, like the 10 best letters all won an original Hour Man drawing by Bernard Bailey. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is one of those contest prizes. It's the only one known to still exist. It's the only piece of Hour Man art by Bailey known to still exist. So there is, there are no interior pages or anything by Bailey of Hour Man that anybody knows about. And it's, it's incredible. It's, it's, you know, what, so, you know, you have to assume that this was one, you know, the letter writing contest was won by a child in 1940. That child kept this drawing, which is amazing. It's beautiful. It's fully finished. Uh, I, I love everything about it. I love the, the little dedication. The, the, so William Carroll, who was the kid who won it, his name appears in the list of winners in Adventure Comics number 57, where they, they list the winners. Uh, really special, really beautiful piece. And I know there's a couple people who are already, I you know a couple people who are going to fight over it. And good for them, I hope. Uh, I hope they I hope they drive up the price. Yeah, it's 1850 right now. I mean, and again, what was the, uh, I didn't even check to see where this one's at. Three, there's, come on, that's, that's going to change. There's no way. Oh, yeah. The family is doing better than that, but I expect that to change too. The next one is another one that's just, it's almost absurd in its, in its, uh, in what it is. So 
This is from 1939 by Carl Burgos. Uh, it's a drawing of the Human Torch. This was made uh, for the, uh, oh God, I forget the names of the people. I should have done some research. Uh, this was done for the publisher of um, a company that was before they got together with Timely, before they hooked up with, with, with Timely. And so, so the, basically, the Marvel Comics exists because, like, I'm, it's in the description. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not prepared. That's okay. I'm trying to read it. Um, and I'll look at the art at the same time myself. Yeah, you could pull up the page. It's fine. Yeah, there you go. And uh, so if you go to the description, it's, which I can't read on this on this monitor for some reason. She's looking for um, so the whole story is there. But so the the Submar the, the Submariner it was a character that had already been created. They brought that over to to Timely where they were like, okay, we can do something with this. They, they wanted to get into comics, but we need a backup feature. So we want a fire character to go with the water character. So then they it basically tasked Carl Burgos with creating the backup feature, which became the Human Torch. The Human Torch in those early appearances is kind of a menacing, scary, faceless figure. In issue four, in Marvel Mystery number four, the Human Torch appears as sort of a more jovial, kind of smiling human torch, you know, and only just for that one story. And this drawing was done ahead of that sort of, that's why it says meet the new human torch. It was sort of like a, a newer version, you know, a new version sort of making him a little more friendly. And uh, that lasted just the one issue. But what you have here is a human torch that looks much, much more similar to the human torch that we know from the sixties. And I think that's fascinating. Also, I mean, aside from that, just the rarity of Burgos' Human Torch art is is extraordinary. And to have just have a piece from 1939 uh, is incredible. Uh, it's yeah, it's a, it's 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 really really stunning. And it, it just historically significant. It's like imagine having a, a drawing of Superman by Joe Schuster that you could date to being having been drawn before like action comics number three or number four right that's that's how significant this piece is i mean any piece of major comic book character art from the 30s it, it, the fact that it exists at all is astonishing so i mean you know it's 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 it's, it's, it's being able to even hold pieces like this and to see, see pieces like this it's amazing well you're fortunate um, to have it, I mean that's that would be pretty cool. I'd love to see this thing in person. So it was it was at OAX though. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't look a lot at OAX. <laughs> uh, sorry to say, but uh, I would love to have seen this piece. Honestly, you know, out of, <laughs> out of a lot of stuff. I mean, there's other pieces that you guys you have in the in these uh, the two days of uh, lots, but I mean, no, I, I, I'm I'm just I'm just giving you a hard time. That's okay. Uh, I deserve it. But. Also from the Burke collection, there's a this is a um, Buck Rogers daily strip uh, by Dick Calkins. This is from 1941. Buck Rogers. Uh, you got yeah, nice you know early Buck Rogers. Uh, all right, this is a page from Slang Slam Bang Comics number five. This is 1940s by James Doolin. Yeah, let me swing over to your camera. Good. There we go. So yeah, just just another just like early golden age comic art. And it's just I love like I find early early late thirties early forties uh, comic art to be just as charming as comic art can get. It's a bunch of people who had no idea what they were doing, uh, making up the rules as they went along, and I find that fascinating. And. Uh, you know, you just end up with really, you know, you see people trying things because they didn't, there were no rules. So they didn't, they didn't know what they could or couldn't do. So they tried everything and what works they kept doing. So. <clears throat> what year was this for? Yeah, the uh, this oh, one, so moving, on, moving on. This one's actually kind of special too. So in 1939, 
uh, Will Eisner was tasked. Will Eisner did it before the spirit, before maybe the Eisner Iger studio may have existed. I'm not, I'm not sure on the dates on that, but it's very, very young, very early Will Eisner was tasked with basically ripping off Superman and creating a superhero. And uh, what, what he created was a character named Wonder Man who appeared in exactly one comic in Wonder, Man, Wonder Comics number one, which is an incredibly rare comic. Uh, and then they were immediately sued by DC for blatantly ripping off Superman, which they definitely did. Uh, and then the, basically they were told to cease and desist. Wonder, Wonder Man can no longer be published. So this page was drawn for Wonder Comics number two and uh, obviously never published because they couldn't. So this is, there, are, there is no art from Wonder Man one or Wonder Comics one, Wonder Man from Wonder Comics one. So what you have is incredibly early Will Eisner art from a character that was sued into oblivion from a comic that was never published but you have your, you know, his, you know, early piece, you know, historic piece from a guy who would go on to be one of the greatest, you know, creators who ever made comics um, from very early in his career. And it's, yeah, uh, uh, I understand why John Burke kept this. It's got a letter from Eisner uh, that that on the back uh, comes with it. Is we saying, um, yeah, uh, say yes, it's my artwork. I cannot. <laughs> Like, yeah, yeah, I have no memory of the cre of the, where the rest of the art went or any much about the creation of it. It was a long time ago. Uh, the letter is, print, is in the uh, listing on the website if you want to read it more closely. But uh, very cool. And, yeah, it's a very nice piece too. And interesting yeah, that it, it, it lasted it, it, all that all that time being unpublished too. Yeah, yeah. No, it's 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 like things like that. You know, things that nobody ever has seen. You know. It's, it's really kind of special. Uh, next one, also by Eisner, is a piece that has been published and is extraordinary. This is a page from The Spirit from uh, 1947. This is uh, April 13th, 1947. Uh, this page has, I mean, you can see in you know less than a decade, Eisner going from sort of figuring himself out to being, to having figured everything out and just, the artwork on this page is breathtaking. If you go down and show the bottom panel, it's it's, it's fantastic. It's glorious. Every I love everything about this page, and the and honestly, for a page with no characters on it, it has no spirit on it. It has no supporting characters on it. It's just Eisner doing what Eisner does, and uh, the price it's at already is a testament to the strength of the artwork, considering it doesn't have. A character to fall back on to say like oh well the value is in the character there's no character here the value is all in the drawing and the drawing is extraordinary yeah it's absolutely beautiful yeah, I would love to have this page yeah I, I, uh, that great like the second panel that like classic Eisner like through the through the window panel if only it were raining it'd be perfect uh, but yeah that also first panel the the the, the last and every the mood in the pages is, it's stunning. Uh, I'm jealous because it's better than the spirit page I have. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't have everything, but what is it, 2150? And uh, this yeah. was 47. Well, I mean, so what was the, pre the prior page? The uh, Wonder, Wonder, Wonder Man. Wonder, the Wonder Man, it was lower, and, but I expect that page to have some, have some, uh, some, some attention closer sure. to the end. But what, uh, what year was that? That was uh, 39. 39. So eight years later, he goes yeah. he goes from Wonder Man to what you see here. Yeah. Uh, you know, like here, you said. Here it started in either late 40, 41, something around mm -hmm. then. Yeah, well, uh, that's, I mean, that just that, that, that just shows you, I mean, how his, his style and his, and his craft and understanding how he wanted to handle storytelling changed so much. And uh, but yeah, that last panel is amazing. This jailbreak is uh, it's fantastic. I love this page. Yeah, no, I, 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 I like it very much. Uh, and now we're into the, the Lou Fine section of the John Burke collection, which is, oh boy, Lou Fine. Uh, <laughs> I don't know which one is first. So which, which, uh, what's uh, which one do I got? I've got the uh, Wonder World Comics uh, number 10. Wonder World, all right. So yes, Lou Fine, this is Lou Fine from 1939. This is from, uh, from The Flame. So the, the, you know, the, in, Wonder, in Wonder World, you know, multiple features. So this is The Flame. 
there's a lot of flame in this case, featuring the flame. But, you know, it, Lufine may be the best draftsman of his era. I, I, I hard pressed to think of anybody better. I think you could make the argument that there are a couple people who could be his, his peers. But I don't know that anybody was better at, at, at drawing at in the late 30s, early 40s than Lufine. You know, you, you Jack Cole was pretty great. Macroboy hadn't come along yet. He's a few years later. Just, uh, I mean, just extraordinary drawing. I, I think Lufine is the equal of Alex Raymond. I, I think it's just, and when we get to the other pieces, you'll see why. Uh, but yeah, and his artwork is not common, especially stuff this early. It's just, it's, oh, it's fantastic. I love it. Yep. Next right. one is, the next one would be the Crack Comics, right? That's the one. Yeah, with, I mean, it's, again, just, it's, even, this is 1940s, 41, so we're, you know, give or take two years later. And, you know, the growth artistically is, it's, oh my God, it's, I, I, I don't know that, there are enough adjectives to describe how good an artist we find. And this page is, I mean, this is train, the train crash in the first panel, the big skull in the, in the, in the opening, just every, everything is perfect. The guy at the bottom in the last panel, the ominous cloaked man, tall, tall bronze mysterious figure. Uh, just, yeah, just absolutely beautiful drawing. Uh, yeah, from, still a time when it's a, from a time when it's shocking that these pages exist. Right, right. You have a good job, Micah. And it's not so bad sometimes. Yeah, this I is got, a, hey, today, today, unrelated from artwork, I got to hold a Stormtrooper helmet that was in, <laughs> that was in A New Hope. But did you try it on? I wanted to, but it was filled with like foam and padding, and I didn't want to muss with it. Uh, well, but, uh, that no one was cool. looking. I would have slipped it. <laughs> T- tried taking a selfie with it on, but no, it's. Uh, I, I do. I, I there's a picture of me holding it. <laughs> I wasn't going to let that go, <laughs> but I was, you know, I wasn't going to hold a stormtrooper helmet and not have evidence that that happened. Because we're not, we're not all David Mandel, and we don't get to play with Star Wars props all the time. Right. Exactly. And he does. Well, he he has he one. Does. He can one. play with Star Wars props at his heart's content. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Uh, no, it's a beautiful page too. This is this is as good as Golden Age art gets. So this is Blue Fine again. This is 1942. Uh, this is one of I believe only two Ray splash pages known to still exist. And I think this is the better of the two. The opening panel is oft reprinted. I mean, I've seen that image multiple times. Uh, it. So I will say with this page, this page has had some had some restoration done on it. It's been conserved. the 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 backing is new. The whole thing's been reinforced. And there was some law. I, it's a question of how much. I'm not quite sure how much. I know. I know for uh, with 100 percent certainty that the big panel is all original. There are elements of the bottom. I don't know if it's one panel or pieces of panels where the page was torn, and there is some some art restoration done down here but uh who cares because this is this is real and this is better so uh but that, you know full disclosure there is that there's been some conservation done on this piece but the 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 big image uh the money image if you will is all is all original by fine it's really hard to tell i mean i, I don't it's very well it's very well done you can sort of see the, the one, I mean, the, the condition is remarkable. So, you, you, you know, the, you can see that there was some some conservation work done. But from an artistic standpoint, it's hard to, to tell what may have been added and what wasn't. It, it's, I, I kind of, for something like this, the historic value is so significant that I wouldn't care. But I would care if it was part of the large panel, but it's not. 100% all original. Yeah. It's still interesting. I mean, I literally don't see anything that, you know, like yeah, a tear. I mean, I mean you can see the color is slightly The color is the only thing. Slightly yeah. different. But 
not so much that it, I think it takes away from the, the quality of the piece. No, not at all. I mean, well, and honestly, get... I'd rather have a little bit of repair work done than a big chunk missing. Very true. Uh, let's see. What uh, are we Kirby to move on. We're going to move up uh, about 20 years, but to something extraordinary. So, Strange Tales Annual number two. This is from uh, 1963. So, this Strange Tales Annual number two. Pencils by Jack Kirby, inks by Steve Ditko, Spider-Man and the Human Torch. This came out the same month as Spider-Man 3. So this is either the fourth or fifth appearance of Spider-Man. And uh, yeah, I mean, Kirby, inks by Ditko, Torch, and Spidey. I, I, these pages are aggressively rare. Uh, there's, I think there's only a handful of them known to exist. They come up for sale very infrequently. The uh, interesting theory that I heard that I can't, I cannot uh, back this up. I don't know if this is true, but it's, you know, hey, what's, uh, when, when did the truth ever get in the way of anything? We all uh, like a good rumor, Micah. What's that? We all like a good rumor. So. It's true. So, and it's like, hey, it's a good story. So basically, so, the, the, you know, it's, it's not, a secret that Kirby was the original artist tasked to draw Spider-Man. And for any number of reasons, they decided to go a different direction and go with Ditko instead, which is, and the world is better because of it. Nobody's complaining. Uh, but Kirby did draw, the rumor has it somewhere between you know, half a dozen and as many as 20 or so pages before they made the change. So the, the story I heard is, is it possible that what became Strange Tales Annual 2, because it's so early, was basically started with those pages that Kirby drew that were rejected? And then had then they had Ditko come in and ink them to give it a continuity connecting it to kind of how Spider-Man was looking in the comics. If mm -hmm. that's true, it's amazing. But I cannot back that up with any facts. But it's a good story, and it, it would play, it would date these pages to actually to pre. It would, it would mean it would mean that the pencils for this page would have been done in in sixty two. But we, there's no way to know the date on the back. The comics code date on the back is sixty three from when the, um, you know when it would have been submitted for approval for the comics code. So that doesn't tell you anything. But it's still regardless of the story whether that's true or not. It's still Jack Kirby with Ditko Inks from nineteen sixty three fourth or fifth appearance of Spider-Man, depending on what book came out and what time of the month where Spider-Man three or annual two, to, you know, you know, give or take a few weeks, but yeah, Spidey and Torch in action throughout. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what more you would want. If you wanted a Kirby page inked by Ditko, there are very few and there are even fewer that are, you know, that still exist or at least known to exist. But yeah, I expect this page to do very, very well. I think it's currently at twenty-seven thousand dollars, and I don't expect that to stay that way. <laughs> uh, no, I uh, I'm not going to hazard. I'm not going to throw a number out there, but yeah, I, I think it's <laughs> considerably I higher. To, yeah. I try not to um, talk about what things could or couldn't do. I, I'll, I'll let the the bidding uh determine that kirby definitely this is answer tony's question in the comments kirby definitely designed spider-man stanley didn't like kirby's design and had Ditko redo it the original kirby design is out there it's weird it, it's googleable very strange yeah yeah it, it was not uh, it's, it's not the way we would ever would have wanted uh spider-man yeah ever. no the, the the kirby version of spider-man is it's not right but you know that just because Kirby was Kirby and Kirby, you know, maybe the greatest creator of comics of all time. Um, you know, that doesn't mean he was great at everything. Mm -hmm. And then certain things where maybe a different artist had a better take on whatever that character was. And Ditko, I think Ditko was a large part of Spider-Man's continued success is what Ditko gave to the character at the beginning. And Kirby's Spider-Man would have been different. So, uh, you know, 
it's all everything works out for the for the right reasons. I think I, I, Kirby's got enough credits to his name. We'll get to another one in a in a little bit, <laughs> a couple more actually. Uh, all right, continuing with the John Burke, we're, we're almost done with the John Burke stuff. Uh, jumping forward another twenty or so years, uh, Scott McCloud, the cover to Zoc number five. Uh, so Scott McCloud, you know, most well known for understanding comics. Mm -hmm. But before that, he did a series called Zot. That is a really, really good, like 80s independent series, but an excellent sort of McLeod, you know, sort of take on, on on superheroes and filtered through the sort of independent lens of the 1980s. Really beautiful work. You know, this artwork doesn't come up very often either. McLeod, uh, you know, I, I don't know if he kept a bunch of it or if it's just people just aren't selling it, but you don't you don't see this stuff very often. And unlike the understanding comic pages, it wasn't uh, submerged in water for some reason. Every understanding comics page I've ever seen is, 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 is has got severe water damage. Yeah, severe is the uh, right. And they still they still sell for decent money. That's because understanding comics is a great comic. It's important. But before that, he did Zod. Zod is also great, and this is a great cover. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. I knew if anybody would care would know about Zod and care about Zod, it would be Mark. Vick. So thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I can say that I I never read Zot. I hate to say it. Next is uh, three pieces by an artist that I was not familiar with, uh, a guy named Dick Ryan. The pages are all from 1937, so really very early, very pre pre Superman comics. Uh, so like early early comic books, uh, but the drawing is great. Like really great sort of anthropomorphic animals. This is from Funny Picture Stories number three, 1937. Uh, we got uh, this one is from Star Comics number four. Oh, we can. Yeah. Uh, nope. Oh, I can switch. I can switch. Oh, no, I got it. <laughs> yeah, the bows and arrows. Really, just really great drawing. Like I wasn't familiar with this artist, and now I want to know everything about him. But yeah, three pieces. They're all relatively inexpensive at the moment. I don't even know what to expect out of them. I've, I've never seen his art before at all, so who knows? I haven't either. Uh, but I mean, how many comics have you read from 1937? Mm, not many. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but we, you know, I, but we've seen strips, you know, from this era before. But no, I, I can honestly say I've never heard of uh, Dick Ryan before. So no, I had never heard of him, and it's kind of right up my alley. So now I'm a fan. Now I want to read a book about him. <laughs> is there one? That will be the question. <laughs> uh, uh, somebody, if there isn't, somebody should write it. Uh, uh, all right, and to finish off the John Burke, there are three pages from Service number forty-four, a comic I have read. So it's from one of the Sideways issues, uh, from towards the end of High Society. So three pages, three Sideways pages from Service forty-four. They're all great. I mean, this is a great time period of Cerebus. It's it's relatively soon after this is when Gerhard came in with the backgrounds, but uh, it, 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 you know, high societies where Cerebus really hit its stride and became sort of a great sort of satire that it would continue on to be and stop being sort of a Conan parody and started being just like a political satire. And uh, yeah, that's if any if nobody if you've never read Cerebus. I recommend starting with High Society. I think it's um, a better place to start than from the beginning. You get enough backstory just from reading it. That uh, uh, I, it's the first service I ever read, and it's what made me love the character and love the comic. And then I went back and read the first one, which is still charming in its own way, and it gets better as it goes. You know, from issue one to I think issue tw I think High Society starts with issue twenty six. So you, you know, the, but you can see the progression in the early ones. But once he really hit gets going. Uh, from about from high society through, let's say right up to you know issue you know in the 140s 150s, uh, it's just a great comic and like a really the story you know has real emotional weight and it you know gets a little gets a little weird towards the end but I mean it's, it stays beautiful throughout and that Sim and Gerhard both when they really connected and and. Uh, and, and we're, we're doing that work at the time. The two of them worked together as well as any artist tandem I can think of. 
and in a way that's unique to them, you know, figures and backgrounds by separate separate artists. Um, I was really, I, you know, it was one of the things I made a point to do at OAX was to talk to Gerhard a little bit, which was nice. He is I, I, <laughs> yeah, sorry. I did get to hang out with him. Yeah. No, I, um, I, 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 I mean, I, yeah, I made a point to go talk to him a little bit, just tell him because I, I hadn't seen him, I hadn't seen Gerhard since 1992. So it was just nice to say, hey, you know, it's been 30 years. Well, he, uh, yeah, I know he does a few Canadian shows every year, but, uh, um, yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't do a lot down here in the States. So it was fun to, fun to get to meet him finally in person after, you know, emailing with him a lot over the last couple of years and doing that one sales show with him. But yeah, yeah, he, he was fun and he was very happy when the show was over. That's good. That's good. One more piece from John Burke that's technically not listed in with the artwork, it's okay. listed in with the comics. So this is. You can scroll down if you want. So this is a bound volume of Headline Comics. Headline Comics uh, uh, from, let's see, this is from, this is from 1942. So Headline Comics was a Simon and Kirby sort of crime, crime series, crime sort of law series, you know. But what makes this bound volume special, so this is, uh, is that this is Jack Kirby's personal copy of the of, of this particular volume of headline comics and it's got a drawing in it. A nice little courtroom, courtroom to pencil drawing by Kirby in the front of the book, which I think is incredible. And I also love that it was his own copy of the book. So it's technically listed in the comic section of Burke, but it's under headline comics and uh, signed by Kirby uh, twice. For some reason, signed again at the back. But yeah, that drawing is great. Uh, nice. I just didn't want anybody to miss it because it's not in the art section, but that is in fact art. And if it stays $400, I'm going to have somebody bid on it so I can have it. <laughs> <laughs> was the, was I'm that not going to do that. Do that. I'm just, I'm, I don't expect it to stay $400, but I also didn't want anybody to miss it because it's not listed in with the art. Right, right. No, that but it's still cool. staying Sunday next uh, next Sunday. Uh, there's only so many pieces of art, so it won't be that far after it. And it, I mean, and if you if you collect comic books as well, Burke's collection of comic books that he kept. Again, this is the things that he kept. Uh, he kept some extraordinarily rare Golden Age comics, stuff that I had never seen. Uh, and his Ditko Spider Man's because you know, man had good taste. Yes, he did. All right, so that's it for John Burke. John Burke, Sunday, Sunday the 17th, so 6 p.m. Regular art session next Monday as normal, 7 o'clock Eastern. Uh, we can dive into that now if you like. We can. I am ready. With, uh, with this guy back here. This is the cover to Fantastic Four Annual number 11 by Jack Kirby and Joe Sinnott. This is 1976, so it's Kirby returning to Marvel, but returning to Marvel and creating a ridiculous Fantastic Four cover. Just insane. So you've got the Fantastic Four fighting the invaders. So you've got all of the FF and then, you know, Cap, Submariner, and the original Human Torch. Uh, Captain, Kirby drew Captain America on exactly two Fantastic Four covers. This one. And the I don't remember the issue, so apologies. It's the the wedding, the Kurt, the I'm sorry, the, the Reed and Sue wedding issue. And in that one, Cap is just sort of in the audience. He's not doing anything; he's just present. In this one, he's engaging and you know battling with Reed. Uh, the the two torches fighting Submariner so down. I, I love everything about this cover. I love. The Sinnet thinking here is incredible. At, at this point, Sinnet knew exactly what Kirby wanted. I mean, they had worked together for so long. Uh, and I think Sinnet, it was Sinnet who said that he never wanted a Fantastic Four piece by Kirby to be inked by anyone else. And you can see on this piece why. And, and honestly, if you're in the market for a Kirby FF cover, because it's not from the original run, this is likely to be 
the best example for the value because it's not going to sell for the, well, I mean, I hope it does, but the likelihood is that it's not going to sell for what it would sell for if it was twice up cover from the 60s. But I would put this up there with, uh, you know, with some of the better FS covers from the 60s. It's, it's amazing. It, it, it's, uh, I can't say enough about it, but yeah. FS annual level. Uh, wow. I mean, just, you know, where it's at price wise now. Yeah. Uh, that just tells you, you know, how important it is and how special it is. It, it's really, good one. it's, it's quite, quite remarkable. And I don't, and I, and it's, I don't think it's going to end there either. I think that there's going to be, I, I, again, I'm, I'm, you know, I understand that it's not a sixties twice up at fantastic four cover, but I, I would I would say that I would rather have this than some than some of those, but that's not for me to decide. Right. Well, uh, you guys are fortunate <laughs> to have it in your, uh, you know, in in this particular auction. I mean, this is a this is a marquee piece. You know, uh, I mean, for it's sure. It's and it's one of the it's one of the nicest pieces that I've uh, had the privilege of of representing. So there, you know, I, 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 yeah, I think it's incredible. No, agreed. Um, it's uh, even Dino says it's amazing, and uh, <laughs> even Dino, Dino. Knows, he knows a few good covers himself. So <laughs> yeah. Well, if Dino uh, thinks it's amazing, then I think that that's all. That's, that's all. That's the end of the. Discussion, really. <laughs> there's no, there's no discounting that. No, no, not at all. But uh, yeah, I'll be curious to see where this one ends up too, because it Me is too. Uh, it's absolutely too. beautiful. Uh, next, we got John B. Sama, uh, Silver Surfer Judgment Day. Uh, you know, we've been lucky that, uh, you know, we've been able, we've, we've sold a few of these over the past few years and, uh, not all from the same consigner. So, so it's just an odd coincidence, but this one, uh, I didn't realize this when we first got it. This is maybe one of the most uh, unique pages from the whole book. So it's, you know, the, the Silver Server Judgment Day is all splash pages by Bissema. Mm -hmm. And, you know, basically, you know, story with it's, you know, Surfer, Mephisto, and Nova, and Galactus are the, the major players in the story. This is the only page from the entire book. I think it's 80 pages or something like that. This is the only page from the entire book that has all four characters on it. Which when I found that out, I was like, that can't be right. And then I checked the book and it is in fact the only page with all four characters on it. Wow. And a great, great Mephisto, great Galactus, Surfer and Nova. I, it's John B. Sema proving that even in 1988, uh, it's like, you know, like the, you know, the guard in comics was changing by that point. You had a bunch of artists come in, sort of act like hot shots. And then John Butema just come in and said, you know, hold, hold my beer. <laughs> <laughs> hold the ink well for me, kids. Let me show you how it's done. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I think it's the only it's the only book like this that Marvel ever did. That's all all splash pages. And if you're gonna let an artist do nothing but splash pages, you could do worse than John Butema. Wow. Yeah, now that is a fantastic piece. Uh, the uh, the answer to the question in the chat. Is that that Conan painting? I assume you're talking about that one over there. That is uh, Simone Bianchi. I believe it is up for sale on our website. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, the, the colors are definitely Simone's. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's on canvas. It's the only painting by Simone that I've ever seen in person on canvas and not on board. Which is honestly why it's still here. It's, it's uh, left over from the gallery show we did with Simone a couple years ago. Right. And, uh, Thankfully, when they when we returned the art to them, that's what's the, what's still available, still listed for sale on our website. But we sent the art, the unsold art back to Italy, and they asked, uh, they told us we could just hold on to that one. And I said thank you because uh, the idea of packing it up and shipping it back to Italy was not something I was uh, looking forward to doing. So, but it lives here, and I'm happy with that too. Well, it's nice that you get you've been able to see it. You can come visit it. Also, a guest at OAX. Well, yeah, I didn't get to talk to. Her. 
<laughs> uh, did I talk to him? I think I said hi to him a few times. I probably said more to him at uh, MegaCon a after OAX mm -hmm. than I said to him during our show. Um, Aaron Odinson says uh, Thor 380 was all splashes. Was that uh, was that science? All right, all right fine. <laughs> the only graphic novel that's all splashes. How about that? Okay, that there you go. <laughs> uh, uh, moving right along, we're, we're, we're an hour in, and we still have a lot to get to. Yeah, we got uh, Sam Keith, uh, Sam Man next, right? Sam Man, Sam Man number one, number one. Uh, so yeah, Sam Keith and Mike Gingerberg, Sam Man one. This uh, so Sam Man one. I think anybody who's watching who's interested in Sam Man knows the story of Sam Man. Sam Man one, like what you know, what happens in it. So this is Sam Man imprisoned, and he's sort of being taunted by you know, Roderick Burgess, his captor, to sort of, you know, give up his secrets. And, he, you know, he's trying to not die, basically, is what happens. And uh, proving unsuccessful because at this point here, he dies. So this page features the death of Roderick Burgess. And uh, so the, you know, as it went along, you know, one of the, the uh, sort of, you know, devices in Sandman is sort of the way his Sandman's balloons are, are depicted, like his 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 text and 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 uh, you know his his uh, word balloons. Um, and this is only the second page in this in the entire series where Sandman's balloons appear, and there's even a note on the side, it's you know re reverse balloon, uh, re you know reverse uh, yeah reverse caption. See page 12, page 12, this is page uh, 19, page 12 would be the first page that the balloons appear, but on page 12, it's, 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 a, it's I think, three or four one-word balloons. So if, it, if this is the kind of thing that matters, um, this is the first balloon in the series of Sandman spoken by Sandman or, you know, thought, thought, the thought balloon, but where you have a, you know, an actual sentence written in the style of Sandman speech bubble. Uh, and also, I mean, Keith and Trudenberg are great. Uh, Sandman is great. I wish I would have bought one of these pages 30 years ago when I had a chance to, and I thought they were too expensive at $800. Yeah, <laughs> surprise, surprise. These, yeah, the number one pages especially, very, very rare. There's, you know, they, they, people don't sell them. They, they don't, they don't come, they, they, you know, some comics just aren't old enough for the, pages to sort of cycle back into the market mm -hmm. and you know the people who have sandman pages keep them and it was there an issue too and, you know they, they kept they kept it going for as long as they could <laughs> yes marcus <laughs> I think he's funny yes he did well he does he does uh but no it's obviously a very very cool page to have him he's like yeah. so there's a few there's been a Super few that popped cool. up of, of late but they're all just amazing and, uh, and i love the you know the 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 sandman pov images in the final two like circular panels um like really clever work being done that that neil gaiman knew what he was doing Amazing. he's got a future i, I tell you <laughs> all right yeah moving, yeah. moving along Moving along, what do we got next? It's, uh, Gene Colan. Gene Colan. This is uh, uh, twice up Daredevil splash by Gene Colan. Colan didn't do Daredevil for a long time before the art got small, so there's not a lot of twice up Colan Daredevil art. This is the splash page to Daredevil 31. Uh, Colan's first issue was 20, so this is in his first year of drawing Daredevil. Just you know, just great big Daredevil figure, just beautiful, like you know. This is 1967, uh, yeah, 60s colon Daredevil. I, I think this is beautiful. Uh, yeah, it's got the Blind Man's Bluff is a great title for a Daredevil story. It's uh, yeah, it's 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 G colon Daredevil. I don't, I don't even know what I don't even I shouldn't even need to sell this. <laughs> no, you don't. You should, I mean, everybody should just want it. I want it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, moving along. Yeah, from issue thirty-one though, that's that's beautiful. And it's a ten thousand yeah. dollars already too. So yeah, this one, Black Panther fans should know this scene pretty well. Mm. Uh, this is uh, Jungle Action number seventeen. So this predates the Black Panther series. This is uh, Billy Graham uh, with uh, inks by Virgil Redondo, so Nesta Redondo's brother. 
And um, yeah, this would be one of the more famous Black Panther splash pages ever drawn. This is, I mean, this scene is this scene is so famous it's in the movie. It's a Killmonger about to throw Black Panther over the over the waterfall in Wakanda. Uh, doesn't go so well for Killmonger at the end, but you know, in the moment, in the moment. But just yeah, one, I mean, for Black Panther fans, of which there are many. Uh, it doesn't get much better than this. And I think the price that this is at now kind of tells you that, that, the, you know, this is, it's, it's, it's really fantastic. All right. Uh, so it's a thousand dollars right now. And you're right. I mean, yes. In, I mean, it, it, for Bronze Age Marvel, Black Panther art, I don't know that there's much better than, than this. It, it, it's, it's, it's special. It's got a note. So on the uh, on the top of the page, it's it's got a it's, it's got a, a, a dedication. It's it says, it says for Billy Billy Graham for all the momentous moments and memories from Don McGregor, who was the you know writer of the writer of this and the creator of so many great Black Panther comics in the seventies. Just uh, really a beautiful piece, beautiful piece. I'm surprised that the person who could sign this. Uh, was willing to let it go. He, that's, you know, I know that it was a difficult decision for him, but it, uh, that difficult decision will be uh, happy for somebody, somebody else. Indeed. Really, yeah. a, a special, a special page. Well, nobody likes to see the hero getting beat up, Alberto. We that's that is more, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, this was you know again, this is a pivotal moment in Black Panther's uh, lore. So yeah, this. No, fantastic. absolutely. You know, I mean, they don't put stuff into the movies just because it happens. They put it, they use the sequences that are important, that resonate. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason why they chose to do that sequence in the first movie. Yeah. Uh, all right, moving on. We have uh, got a couple of Tom for on Spider-Man pages. I'm going to start with the second one, so, because it makes sense. So, this is the, the I've been doing this for a long time. I've never held one of these pages in my hands. This is a McFarlane page from Spider-Man 298. So for you know McFarlane's first issue, uh, one of only two issues McFarlane drew of Spidey in the black costume. Uh, it, it's it's you know this is kind of it's, it's a turning point for Spider-Man because you know McFarlane coming onto Spider-Man was I mean I don't, I'm not saying people knew it immediately, but the change that McFarlane gave to Spider-Man and really just a kickstart to all of comics uh, starts here. You know, you, you know, yeah, he did his Hulks and, you know, some other things here and there, but it was Spider-Man that really changed everything. And uh, to have a page from the first issue, I think, I think a lot of people, I think a lot of people are going to fight over this page, when, you know, next week. Uh, I can't, uh, I can't imagine why you wouldn't want it. It's really, it's, 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 Still great. It's super McFarlane. You've got McFarlane webbing, which had never been done really before this issue. And just, it's, it, I mean, again, I've never seen one in person before this one. And when we got it in, it was, it was, it was, uh, I was like, whoa, was that a, I, cause I don't think we knew what we were getting when we got it. And I was like, what is that? But yeah. Yeah, that is Bob McLeod Inks, Antoine. Yeah, McLeod. Yeah, signed by McLeod, signed by McFarlane. Uh, yeah, just, you know, if, if the McFarlane who drew this knew what was in store, it would have been, it would have been an interesting conversation. <laughs> yeah, and it is Zifatone in the uh, in yeah, yeah. lower left-hand panel. Yep. But we, which is a great Spidey panel, great McFarlane Spidey down there in that, in that panel. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He hadn't quite gotten crazy yet. It took McFarlane a couple issues to go completely insane <laughs> with, with the way he drew Spidey. But you can see it. You can see it there. You can see that is definitely a McFarlane Spider-Man. I mean, you can tell even from that. Mm -hmm. And you can tell it's Bob McCloud Inc. too. Yeah, I mean, Bob's yeah. always and, and, McCl you know, and McFarlane's a guy who is difficult to ink. Uh, because he, he, McFarlane has such a specific style that it's, sometimes it's. You know, it's 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 a dif it's difficult to capture, and I think the cloud did a really good job capturing McFarlane's energy. 
That's a very nice page. So uh, you said we have another one? I think we do have another one. So this is a page from Spider-Man 319. So by this point, McFarlane had figured everything out. Uh, so you got Spider-Man zipping across the top, getting uh, trying not to get killed by a blades of helicopter, crashing into the water. I love this panel of Spidey's uh, his eyes just kind of coming out of the water. I love when I love Spidey's eyes being expressive. It's it's completely unrealistic, and I don't care because it's comic books. But yeah, I love that panel. And the bottom panel with the cityscape is just McFarland could draw. And, you know, let's let's you know, we, we all know he could draw like, you know, a guy with his feet over his head. But like that cityscape in that bottom panel is excellent. And yeah, Spidey Spidey's pretty much everywhere all year. Uh, uh, yeah, I, another great, you know, great McFarland Spidey page. I mean, there's not a lot more that needs to be said about these. They they are what they are and what they are is amazing. Uh, and they are, and that's uh, almost a 10. Yep. Doing well. Yep. Again, those pages, they, they, they'll do what they do. Uh, all right. Now we got, we're going back to Jack Kirby. We're going back to, back to 1962. So this is uh, Journey to Mystery 86. This is the fourth appearance of Thor. So you know, incredibly early Silver Age Jack Kirby art. So Thor... Uh, so, I mean, the order of Marvel heroes goes Fantastic Four, Hulk, then Thor, then Spider-Man. So, uh, yeah, I mean, Thor is one of the earliest earliest of, of the Marvel heroes. These early stories do not come up for sale. They just don't. Uh, you know, you, you know you, the Thor art, you know, the Thor art is out there. It does not come up for sale. This page, this, this, this story, Journey 86 was sold complete by Kirby in the 80s to somebody who kept it for about 20 years, who then also sold it complete in the early 2000s. And uh, as far as I know, I think only two or three pages from that story have sold publicly since then. Most of the story is still together. And just to see a page from Kirby from this early, this is uh, inks by Dick Ayers. Uh, you know, it's a great, great Thor. I love this set, this uh, the panel three with Thor from the back. Very regal, sort of, you know, a panel worthy of the God of Thunder. Uh, some Kirby machinery in it. It's great. It's, it's just, it, you know, just to, to see any of the Kirby art from this time period, specifically, like the Strange Tales annual page and this page, uh, you know, it's, it's, just it's stuff you don't see every day. And, you, you know, Kirby art is out there. There's a lot of it. He, he drew, what, 100,000 pages or something like that. But some there's certain specific things that collectors don't part with. And these are those. You know, those early Marvel hero pages don't come up super often. And this, yeah, Journey 86 predates Avengers 1 by almost a year. And, you know, Thor was probably second to the Fantastic Four and Spider-Man uh, the biggest Marvel character of, it, of the time. Like, there's mm -hmm. a reason why in the in the first few issues of the Avengers, Thor is the star because he was he was the popular character. Spider Man was Spider Man obviously in the Fantastic Four were not in the Avengers. Captain America doesn't come in until later, so it's you know Thor was the was the draw, and this you know and then this page predates that by a year. Well. Uh, Elbro yeah. says, I need this page. Of course, I need this page, but I will not be going after this page, Elbro. Uh, but yeah, no, no. I mean, well, I'd love them. We, 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 don't, we, we don't need anything. We want lots of things. <laughs> uh, Except yeah. for the things that I definitely need. And then if you have those things, you should just give them to me because mm -hmm. I need them. <laughs> uh, but no, it's, it is beautiful. I, like you said, I think the third panel is the best. I love that. I really, it's really, it's really beautiful. I mean, it's, you know, you, you can get jaded when you see this stuff every day. Uh, and, you know, so that's what sometimes when you know when something is really special, you know, like th these, you know, something where you know that it's not, it's not common to get to even see them. So something, you know, something like this page or, like the the Lufine pages from earlier, or the Strange Tales annual page, or the um, maybe that Black Panther splash. It's like you know things that are like wow, they, most people never get to see this. 
And, and I don't take that lightly or for granted, you know, I, I love that I get to live with these things for as long as I do because I, you know, because I can't keep them. Uh, let's move along with move along. Next up, uh, a page from X Men Alpha Flight number two by a couple of a couple of guys named Smith. So this is uh, Paul Smith with inks by Barry Windsor Smith, uh, and uh, that's pretty cool if you ask me. Uh, Barry Smith inked five pages from X Men Alpha Flight number two. This is one of those pages. It's Loki and uh, I want to say somebody, Polaris. I'm not 100 percent sure, <laughs> but I mean, I don't know that the two of them worked together ever on anything else, and I wish they had because the, the it it is representative of both of them. It looks like both of them. You know, Barry Smith's inking, you know, can be a little overwhelming, and it clearly looks like Barry Smith, but it retains its Paul Smithiness, and I like that. Uh, yes, it does. Yeah, Barry, Barry could be a little overpowering, but um, yeah. Well, you don't hire Barry Smith to ink something and not expect it to look. Like no, Barry. of course not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, even the Kirby story that he inked is like, yeah, no, we get it. Mm -hmm. Uh, but no, that page is great. Um, and I'm really happy with where it's at because it was, you know, it's hard to predict a page like that because there's so few of them. And I mean, I know we all know Paul Smith X-Men is, you know, everybody wants Paul Smith X-Men. But, uh, you know, I didn't know what to expect from this page and I'm pleased that it's doing very well. And I know the consigner is very pleased as well. Uh, next, I'm trying to move along. All right, we've got a couple Let's get back to the Venom for a little bit. So we've got a couple of, uh, we've got the symbiote suit from McFarlane for pre-Venom. Now we've got a couple of like right in the wheelhouse of like classic Venom. So this is Mark Bagley. We've got a page. This is the first one is a page from uh, Spider-Man 375. It's a great Spidey Venom battle page. This is, I think that, you know, the, some characters take some time to evolve. And Venom you know, came along in, you know, Spidey 300 and kind of came back a few times after that. And I, I and then I think, believe they kind of killed Venom. Uh, we have a page from that coming up later. Uh, and then he, I think Venom stayed dead for a little while, year and a half, two years, something around there. And then when they brought, when they brought Venom back, uh, right around here, it was kind of led into the maximum carnage and that's that old, old carnage storyline. Uh, that's kind of when Venom really, I think, clicked with audiences and became the like superstar that he continues to be. Uh, and that's this. So that's this page from 375, which is a story called uh, uh, Spidey Spider-Man versus Venom's final final confrontation, and, which is just a great great action page by Bagley. And then a page from 379, which is like smack dab in the middle of Maximum Carnage. So. No carnage, but great venom, great venom, black cat, uh, uh, cloak and uh, you know, cloak and dagger, some great Spidey. I love the Spidey close up down in the last panel. Uh, yeah, really like two really, really, really perfect examples of that sort of like 1990. This is 1993 uh, Bagley venom, and, and and again, this is sort of when Venom became Venom, you know, and not just another Spidey villain. Uh, really extraordinary, really, I was, uh, you don't, again, and because they're not really that old, they're not, they're not pages you see all that often. And to get two of them at once is really, was really special. Uh, and a little you guys, bit of- You guys have the, the market cornered on uh, Spidey stuff from this, this era, it feels like. Last couple of years, you've you've had a, had quite a few pages. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, you know, there's also there's an element of like, you know, when things start selling for money, the people who have had them for thirty years are like, how badly do I need this? <laughs> and I understand that. Sure. I wish I had, I wish I had that problem more often. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but yeah, those those Bagley pages, um, that stuff that you just don't see them often. 
and I'm I'm happy to I'm happy to represent them. Uh, we got ne oh next we got this uh, this Jay Scott Campbell. Speaking of stuff from the early '90s, we're flush with early '90s quality in this auction. So this is double spread Gen 13 number five. This is from the mini series. So this predates the Gen 13 regular series. And uh, yeah, I mean Campbell with the, the entire team, you know, basically like full page height for the whole team. And yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's lovely. Yeah. And Gen 13, you know, another one of those early image series that um, really just took off like a, like a rocket. I, that comic got real popular real fast. And I don't know that that wasn't, uh, you know, had, didn't have a lot to do with J. Scott Campbell's drawing. You know, he was relatively new at the time. And I think the, the, his continued popularity even through to now uh, is a is a sign that like he really clicked right away and, and honestly he came out of the gate strong there's you, you don't see like the growing pains as much as you see on a lot of artists like this is if you know this is you know fully formed and, and like fully like you know in you know, the style is figured out and the, the drawing is figured out. He knew exactly what he was doing. And it's a great, great example of early Campbell, as, as good an example of Gen 13 Campbell as I've ever seen. Uh, I, I think it's, it's, I think it's wonderful. If, and to go with those, to go with that, there's a couple of Gen 13 prelim pages, also in the auction. Uh, the page from Gen 13 number zero, well, four, four pages. His prelims, he would do four pages. Four pages, not a single sheet, so page, page, page. So yeah, four pages of layouts from Gen 13 number zero, and four pages from Gen 13 number 20 from the regular series. But still, like clearly, Campbell, you know, it says even in the prelim form, it's still uh, identifiably J. Scott Campbell. Uh, next up, Bob Layton. I talked to Bob about this cover at LAX because I had a question for him and he didn't have an answer for me. No, okay. really? What, what was the question that Bob could not answer? So, <laughs> so the, so the, this, so the cover to shield number six, the Savage shield number six. So the, it, on, in the printed cover, she Hulk is printed in green as a reflection on Iron Man's helmet. So she Hulk's on an overlay underneath that, just big Iron Man face. So the She-Hulk image is a stat. So it's, it's, it's got some touch-ups in it and some white-out and just some corrections, corrections on, the, on the stat, but that's not uh, art. And I asked Bob where that drawing was. And he said, well, that's, that's not the original drawing. And I was like, nope. And he looked at it and he said, hmm, I guess some editor at Marvel stole it in, uh, in the early 80s. And I was like, fair enough. <laughs> 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 but That's unfortunate. But latent pencils and inks. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's Iron Man. <laughs> Iron Man by Bob Lane. I mean, that's a that's a pretty good combination of character and creator. And you know, and she she Hulk's no slouch. I like she Hulk, but it's very, it's very very cool. And I believe if you're looking for a bargain, uh, it's going to go for much much less than if that were an Iron Man type cover and not a She Hulk cover. That is uh, probably we true. For, Where's that now? Fifty one hundred dollars. We look for uh, we look for bargains where we can, Bill. Mm -hmm. Of course. And, yeah, I think the price on that has gone up since the last time I looked at it. Well, just wait till that art surfaces one day, <laughs> <laughs> because it, it very well could. You know, you never know. But uh, yeah. that's funny. No, nice, nice piece though. Early, early She Hulk. No, I, and it's very early She-Hulk. I don't think she made an appearance outside of her title yet at this point. So She-Hulk number six would be the sixth appearance of She-Hulk. Mm -hmm. Next up, this, this piece is interesting for a couple of reasons. So it's John Arita Jr. Uh, Daredevil. This is from uh, a Daredevil portfolio that was, I believe was published in 1991 uh, in France. And it's not, the portfolio itself is not that hard to get. It, it was imported at the time, but What's interesting about it is so all the pieces for that portfolio were created new for that portfolio. 
and Ramita Jr. inked them all himself. And I don't know that I had ever seen uh, Ramita Jr. inking himself ever before. And it's really interesting. Uh, there's some really interesting techniques in the background, especially that's like the almost painted behind the Daredevil silhouette. It's like so white paint back there. The the drawing in the in the on the fence is sort of like a gray. It's not really black. It's it's not pencil, but it's not black. It's actually white paint over a very very fine toned zipatone in the background. Uh, but a really great dramatic Daredevil reveal shot. A uh, very classically Romita Jr. Uh, no, I think this piece is is great, uh, and that's true. Get, no, Ramita Jr. can draw a flat, uh, punched-in nose as good as anybody. <laughs> and I don't see Nick Berucci's name on here anywhere. I'm, I'm missing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think Nick's picked up enough art for the last. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, Nick has picked up some very, very nice pieces over the past couple months. Uh, you know, we can all we, we can all cry a little bit for for, for <laughs> Nick maybe not being able to get everything. He Exactly. I'm not saying he can't get it. <laughs> I don't think you know. He went to OEX. He, he told me he didn't. He wasn't, he wasn't <laughs> going right. to be a big buyer when he went there. But that's okay. Yeah. I am fully. I'm fully on board with Nick Berucci's new name being Ramita Junior Man. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I I would agree as well, Marcus. That's, that, would, that's that would be very funny. I think Nick would also find that uh, amusing. So somebody needs to make him a T-shirt and send it to him. <laughs> I've got his mailing address for those of you who might like yeah, to do that. Like steal, steal Mike's logo and just steal, <laughs> you know, use the Ramita Man logo and throw a junior in the middle. Oh, man. That would be great. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, this is a fantastic piece. I, I really I really like it a lot. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean Daredevil uh, is pretty we damn. Got a lot, we got a lot to get to still. So. We do. Let's, let's, right. let's keep this thing rolling. What do we got? Trying, trying to keep moving. Uh, Jim Aparo, uh, Metal Men. Aparo, I think he only did a handful of Metal Men covers. Uh, this is uh, Metal Man number 55. It's uh, yeah, Metal Man versus the Missile Men, who were the villains in the Metal Man number one. And this is Aparo kind of doing a play on the cover to Metal Man one. Just, uh, so it's a different angle, but it's sort of a, a similar concept. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Slate 6, this is 1977. That's, it's, yeah, Aparo, uh, yes, for like, 60s and you know late 60s through the 70s DC Caparo just did some extraordinary work you know and then it obviously is the 80s on his Batman uh, which is I mean that's the stuff that I grew up with but going backwards he did some really really beautiful stuff and a lot of it sort of under the radar Aparo uh, I, I don't know that he got the respect till later I think he's gotten it now I think you know for sure uh, people people you know, you know, uh, don't take Aparo for granted anymore. But he was around for a long time, and he, you know, he, he drew into the 2000s. But this is a great, this is maybe one of his better Metal Men covers, if not the best one. And I love the Metal Men because I like things that are fun and fun DC Metal Men, Doom Patrol, all the fun DC titles. Oh yeah, uh, I love all that stuff. Metal Man was, was always a fun read. Even I, I read a few uh, books, not many, but enough to know that it was it was enjoyable. Oh yeah, no, for sure. This is uh, Lee Weeks. This is uh, the Hulk 1999 annual cover. So, so Lee Weeks doing the Hulk transformation. So you got a great Hulk transformation sequence, and then you got basically every Hulk supporting character that there is hanging out down here. You know. Um, Bet, you know uh, Betty Ross and Thunderbolt Ross and Rick Jones and this guy. <laughs> but yes, this is Lee Weeks inks by Dan Green. Uh, I love Dan Green's inks. He passed away last year, just unfortunate. But I'm a big fan of Dan Green. We've got some really nice Dan Green inks pages coming up. But uh, yeah, Lee Weeks, great Hulk cover. Uh, Lee Weeks, I told him this to his face a year or two ago at a show. I told him that he annoyed me because he kept getting better. Like artists aren't supposed to continue getting better. <laughs> At some point, you just gotta level up. It's like he, he, the stuff he's doing now is remarkable, and he's been making comics for over thirty years. It's it's, it's a little bit annoying. Yeah. Well, you want to, you want him to evolve. What did he say to you when he said that? He said he said I think he said I'm sorry. 
<laughs> or you could have even sorry or thank you. It could have it been one or the other. Um, what we, let's see. What do we got now? We got some more quality 90 dark. It's uh, Joe Casada, uh, X Factor Annual Number Seven cover. Got uh, basically the X Factor, like the Mojo. Uh, really, Casada. This is 1992. Inks by Joe Rubinstein. Uh, but very much Casada. Casada hit another guy who kind of hit his sort of identifiable style pretty early on because at this point he'd only been making comics for a few years. And uh, you got that great, the big sort of like, you know, sort of shadowy, sort of almost silhouette mojo in the background with the classic mojo smile. And then you got all of, all of X Factor down here, the spiral with her swords coming in to, uh, to fight them. But yeah, you got, you know, strong guy being gigantic and the rest of you got, you know, multiple man and uh, the rest of it, Havoc and that Polaris, uh, Wolfsbane. Uh, yeah, that classic, like early 90s X Factor team. But yeah, really like classic Casada, And you know it's old because he signed it with his whole name and not just a Q. But yeah, just yeah, great '90s Marvel X cover, Pakistan. Next, uh, next is the best Wolf's Rotasio page I've ever seen in person. So this is uh, X Factor number this is X Factor number sixty-nine. It's from nineteen ninety-one, uh, and uh, the whole bunch of X-Men on this X Factor page. You got Rogue and Forge and Banshee. And down here, being all being all tough guy, uh, Wolverine with his claws. You got a Wolverine with his claws out. You got a snick at the bottom. You got a great big be a half splash panel of Forge and Wolverine. It's it's just it's it's I I and I lo I like protect when I when when I was reading these comics at the time. I liked Protasio more than I liked Jim Lee. And this is so much energy in this page. It's, it's, and yeah, it's, that's a great Wolverine. He drew a real ferocious Wolverine. Jim Lee draws a great Wolverine. Don't get me wrong, but he doesn't have this sort of ferocity. He's like animal, animalistic that Protasio brings to it. Um, no idea who inked this page. This page is the inking credit on this issue was Task Force X. Which is one of Marvel's codes for whoever was available. <laughs> um, but it inked very well. I did no no criticisms. Uh, I asked. I did reach out to Scott Williams to ask if maybe it was him or if he knew, and he said it was not him. And he he didn't he didn't have any immediate guesses as to who it might have been. But an excellent page, really really great. And again, a lot of these pages by these artists from the you know the from the title that you don't you don't see them all the time. No. Uh, next, I'm going to make you all people do some work if you want. So this is uh, this is a complete 20, 20 page story by Pablo Marcos. This is uh, the Atlas Seaboard title Iron Jaw number two. This is the entire issue. Uh, it's all it's all as good as the splash. All the pages are imaged on the on the on the website. But uh, yeah, Marcos, really great work. This, so many artists did good work for on the Atlas titles that it's a shame that they didn't do better from a sales standpoint because they were they were very beautiful. And we had uh, the Frank Thorne story in the last auction mm -hmm. that was also really great. And it's like, look at how beautiful these pages are. Like, yeah, they are amazing. It's just really, really. Uh, fantastic drawing, just, but I mean, it's got bears in it. I mean, and a unicorn, <laughs> and a unicorn. <laughs> <laughs> wow! But no, I mean, look at it. It, it, it is amazing. I mean, the the Atlas books were always fun, and uh, yeah, yeah and, and, you fun. know, some really good artists worked on those books, and I don't think a single one of those titles went past four or five issues. Mm -hmm. I got several off the spinner rack back in the day at my local drugstore. So there you go. Remember, yeah. Hard to forget. They had great covers. Yeah, they did indeed. 
Wow. So it's cool. You, you know, you, they have, uh, you know, I mean, all a complete story from 75. It's very nice. Pablo Marcos. That's, yep. Oh, man. Uh, so yeah, all, the page, all the pages are on the site if you want to go through. Uh, we only have so much time. We do, and we still have a lot of a lot more pieces to look at. Yeah, John Sable next. Yep, Mike Grell, John Sable, freelance number seven. Uh, I mean, Mike Grell really embracing the James Bondiness of John Sable freelance with what could have really could be a James Bond movie poster. Like uh, Grell was great at that sort of very specific st style of of uh, composition and that sort of very classic, almost a uh, paperback novel cover. You know, mm -hmm. uh, and this is a great one. This is one of the better John Sable covers, if you ask me. Really, really great. Uh, I've been a fan of John Mike Rells for a long time, since uh, I, I, yeah, I really embraced his Green Arrows when I was in high school. So love Longbow Hunters, and then his Green. It's still my the Green. I said Green Lantern. I meant Green Arrow. Uh, so those are still my favorite Green Arrow comics. The uh, the Grell Green Lantern, Green Arrow series. Uh, I like the sort of. Batmanification of Green Arrow, taking his tricks away and making him just be a guy who was good at really, really good at something and without having to use gimmicks and tricks. Uh, if you've never read those comics, anybody, they're very, very good. I am a anyway. big fan of Mike Grell's work. Yep. Next up, we got War Machine. By Joe Jusco. This is uh, one of the Marvel Masterworks cards. This is from uh, the Marvel Master. This is Marvel Master. I'm sorry, Marvel Master Pieces. This is from the 1993 Masterpieces set. Uh, so Jusco painted all of the 92 set. And I have a little backstory on this piece because he did not do all of the 93 set, but he did all the 92. And when Marvel, because the 92 set was so popular, Marvel re republished them as co in comic books as comic book sized comics with you know just the cards printed as pages of comics and they wanted some new pieces so that it wasn't just duplicating the cards so they had just go do I think something like half a dozen new new paintings and um, some of them were included as bonus cards in like a collector set of the 92 series and some of them were used in the 93 series. So that's what this one is. So it was painted originally for the 92 series comic book reprints and then used published as a card in the 93 series. But I think that anybody who knows who's ever been looking for these knows how hard it is to get just those 92 cards series art. They're uh, incredibly sought after. And there's a couple of very, very, very hardcore Marvel card art collectors. One of them, had a nice little display at Oyers. That is very true. We've got and to meet a, meet a few of these hardcore collectors. They're going to be a big part of year two, I think, too. So, yeah. yeah. And, and honestly, seeing some of those cards in person, I was never a card guy. I mean, I like art, and I, I, I bought some cards just because there's good art in them. But uh, seeing some of the card art in person, especially the more, the ones like sort of after, like the ones from the mid, late 90s and after, when I was basically out of that stuff completely, it was really nice. It was eye-opening sometimes to see uh, things that I'd never, you know, things that I'd never seen before, and be like, "Oh, there's some really great stuff that was done for this these these sets." And uh, another piece by Justo, just to, while we're on the Justo, this is a this is an unpublished pinup of uh, Satana, uh, you know, Satana, uh, son of Satan, sister. Uh, this was so Justo made this was a, originally going to be either his first either his first or his second published piece for Marvel. It was done for one of the um, you know, the black and white magazines from the 70s. And Jusco, I think he was like 17 or 18 years old when he did this. And Marvel ended up not using it. So it's unpublished. It's 1978. Uh, so if, if, you, if you look closely, you see almost the entirety of Satana's figure is whited out and redrawn. And you'll notice that her costume is weird. And that's because Marvel had redesigned Satana's costume and asked Jusco basically to, after he had drawn her classic costume, to change it to the new one. And then they never used it. They never used the, the, they never used the drawing and they never used this costume. 
but it's it's you know it's a still a really great piece. I, I, I actually really like Jusco's black and white work. He's a better pen and ink artist than people maybe know because he's so well known for painting. But the man has chops. Chops, I say. Yeah, well he uh you know Bisem is probably his favorite artist, so oh, yeah. using him yeah. as a but there's some there's some rights in here. There's the creatures in the background, there's a lot of some rights in, in there. Uh yeah, I mean he he continues to have excellent taste and could not be a nicer human being. Jusco is very nice and he's very uh open with answering me answering my questions and helping when I don't know the answers to things. <laughs> Uh, oh. This is another complete story. It's uh, Alex Nino. This is from Rima, the Jungle Girl number two. This is a backup feature. Uh, the Delta Brain Space Voyagers. Uh, this story is amazing. It's it the the rest of the pages are in the second image. If you want to pull up the rest of the uh, the other the other page, it's only five pages. But Nino, oof, oh my God, it's so good. <laughs> Uh, I think, uh, I mean, I think most artists go well, their whole careers wishing they could draw as well as Nino did in a way that, that looked like it came easy to him. I mean, oh. that's amazing. Wow. It's a classic 70s science fiction comic art. It's, it's, oh, it's really sad. It reminds me of, it, it looks, um, for people who know like French science fiction artists, it's got a little drie in it. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's very it's very European. I mean, Nino's Filipino, but there's a very European style to his drawing. Uh, and it really really shows here. Look at that that face and that that woman's face in that panel. Really beautiful. Yeah, that it's it's. Ugh. Somebody's going to have to yeah, well, that, get that one in their collection. Because we don't have enough early 90s Marvel art. We have uh, Dale <laughs> Keown. This is from Hulk 377. Maybe one of the more classic issues from his run on the Hulk. The one with the big green cover with the Hulk silhouette. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, just... So basically, you have a whole bunch of Hulks on this page. You've got Banner. Banner sort of trying to reunify the like sort of split Hulks. And then this is at the end. This issue ends with them sort of all becoming sort of the the one, the one sort of that classic Peter David sort of intelligent Gray Hulk. Uh, but that that yeah that third panel is as classic Dale Keown Hulk as really you can get. Uh, signed at the bottom by Peter David. Uh, yeah, no, I mean I loved these comics. I loved Dale Keown on this on this series. Just really beautiful. Uh, classic, classic drawing. I mean, it's like sometimes you don't necessarily have to be showy. Just do, if you do what you do very, very well, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it's better than gimmicky, show, showy kind of drawing. And Keon was great at that. Just pure just classic comic book storytelling. Uh, yeah. A great and a great Hulk artist, like one of the best. I think if you had to rattle off your top three or four Hulk artists, Keon would be on that list. Definitely uh, one of the more popular. And another complete story. This is uh, Action Comics number 396. This is uh, Kurt Swan and Murphy Anderson. Uh, so it's a 13 uh, page story, uh, 1971. To the best of my knowledge, and again, I could I could be wrong about this. Uh, the only complete, you know, Swanderson Superman story from its time period. And the, those, you know, Kurt Swan and Murphy Anderson, one of the best, art, you know, pencil or inker tandems in all of comics. Yeah, it's got a double spread in it. So you can see the, the first image there. So the first image is the double spread. The second image is all the, the individual pages. Mm -hmm. uh, you just, I mean. Murphy Anderson understood Kurt Swan the way, like, you know, Sinnott and Royer understood Kirby, or, you know, the way, you know, uh, you know, certain inkers just understand certain arts, the way, like, 
you know, the way Paul Neary understood Alan Davis, the way Scott Williams understands Jim Lee, the way Terry Austin understood John Byrne. It's, it's, you know, it's one of those classic pencil or anchor combinations. And then, and Murphy Anderson was a great artist in his own right. So, you know, playing second fiddle, I don't think was something that he was necessarily thrilled about, but he, I think he really took to it and embraced it. And really, I think he enjoyed working with Swan. That's Fortress of Solitude there. Yeah. Yeah. Classic, classic, you know, or late silver, early bronze age Superman. Uh, hard to imagine. Yeah. Do you have more c complete stories in this auction? Mm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, all right. Next up, uh, more Superman. This is Bob Oxner. This is the cover to Action Comics number 453, it's 1975. And basically, Clark Kent's been knocked out and somebody, some some, some terrible evildoer is taking on Superman's identity to, uh, to really sully his name, I imagine. But a great classic sort of fun Bronze Age DC cover. Um, Oxner is another guy. I don't know that Oxner is appreciated as much as he should be. He was so versatile. I mean, he's the guy who could draw, you know, like straight, you know, straight superhero stuff like this as well as anybody. And then also go off and draw like Stanley and his monster, Angel and the Aper. You know, and like there's really like quality humor, humor titles as well. Just uh, a real artist. And a fun name to say. I just like saying Oxner. <laughs> Well, no, it's a it's a pretty cool cover, man. It's uh hey, Alberto, there's more Marvel, Marvel while coming. You don't go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Hold it, Alberto. <laughs> what do we got next? Let's see. Next we got uh this is Gene Colin. This is from the second appearance of the Falcon. So this is uh, Captain America number one eighteen. So you've got Falcon and so Steve Rogers uh basically leaping into frame as in classic Gene Colin fashion. Uh, and uh Beating some people up. Uh, but yeah, set, so yeah, second appearance of the Falcon. This is a great splash page from the second Falcon. Uh, yeah, this is uh, this is Colin and uh, Joe Sinnott. And again, Sinnott, I mean, we talked about him earlier, but man, guy knew how to ink. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Colin, Colin knew how to elongate, but in a way that is, is something... Is he, even even in that the Daredevil splash that we showed earlier, um, Colin did things anatomically that were very very unusual, and very very specifically Gene Colin, and it makes his work um, instantly identifiable. And that's it's a rare trait. It's harder to do than you think to draw in a way that is instantly recognized as you. Uh, speaking of people who do that. Eric Larson. <laughs> this is uh, Spider-Man 333. So we talked earlier about how Venom sort of, you know, was here and there and then he died. So this is where Venom dies for the first time. That's the symbiote dead on the ground and Eddie Brock uh, none, none too pleased about it. And, um, and Spidey picks up the Venom symbiote and hopes that that's the last he'll see of Venom. Um, fingers crossed, Spidey. Fingers crossed. <laughs> but we all we've talked about these pages before. Larson Spider-Man pages in this time period were sadly mo most the majority of them were destroyed in a in a in a fire. Uh, so they're not common. And uh, this is a great one. Uh, I you know Larson. Lar nobody has more fun drawing comics than Eric Larson. I stand by that. And I think it's still true today. I mean, he, there's a reason why he's been doing the Savage Dragon for so long and doing it exactly the way he wants to. He's uh, he's privileged to make the comics that he loves to make and that he wants to read. And that's every every artist's dream is to make the work that that they want. Uh, moving along, back to this Simone Bianchi, the. Bianchi's uh, sort of recreation slash reinterpretation of the cover to Silver Surfer number four. So instead of Star Surfer fighting Thor, he's fighting the thing. 
with the rest of the FF in the background. But I, this is one of my favorite pieces by Bianchi that I've ever seen. It's, I think he really, really enjoyed doing it. You know, you can always, you can tell, especially on a piece like this, when an artist is, is, is having a good time. And it looks like he probably spent more time on this than he originally wanted to. It's really densely detailed, really, the colors are vibrant and bright. Uh, and yeah, Bianchi understands power and, and, and motion as well as anybody. Beautiful painting. And next, uh, Bill Sienkiewicz. This is from Ultimate Marvel Team Up number six. Uh, this is page one. So it's a Spider-Man and the Punisher. This is the Ultimate Marvel Team Up number six was the introduction of the Ultimate version of the Punisher. So this is the his very first interior page. Uh, beautifully designed by Sienkiewicz. I think there's no reason to expect anything less from him. Uh, always making interesting choices. The way the Punisher symbol is worked into the face at the top, the way Spidey's face is worked into the bottom. Uh, and Sienkiewicz is an incredibly smart artist, and you see it here. This uh, really beautiful drawing. Art, you know, artists who maintain sort of a popularity over decades is rare. Sienkiewicz is now on, what, his fourth or fifth decade? Of being, you know, that's at the top, top of the field. Uh, Excalibur from the Excalibur special by Alan Davis. I'm going to breathe through some things now. Apologies. Uh, more Davis Excalibur pages, page from uh, page from issue 66. Got Sentinels on Sentinels by Excalibur on this one. You got all sorts of Alan Davis y wackiness. I love this comic. Uh, let's see, let's see time. It's a great, uh, great George Tuska. Tuska with inks by Billy Graham. Uh, uh, Hero for Hire, Hero for Hire number three, the splash page. Uh, yeah, Tuska, newly inducted into the Eisner Hall of Fame, and just a great '70s Blue Cage splash. It's wonderful. Uh, and we have three, three, three. Mark Silvestri, Wolverine pages. Bam, bam, bam. My favorite work Silvestri ever did. I, I, I think his drawing on the Wolverine is wonderful. I think I, I think part of that is Dan Green Dinks. I think they worked together great. This page, for people who remember the Wolverine series, um, there was the android Wolverine named Albert. This is the first page he appears on. So this is I hate to use the term, but this is Albert's birth page. Albert, Albert the Wolverine Android, uh, who was a major part of that series for, for a good while. And then another great one, this is uh, you know, Wolverine and Nick Kate, Nick, uh, geez, Nick, Kate, Nick Fury. <laughs> and the, uh, this is the, uh, the other Android um, that Wolverine is trying to that she's trying to, I, it's been a long time since I read these comics. Albert basically ends up being the protector of this Wolverine, of this and this Android girl. There's Albert, Albert down here. He's getting a little falling apart. Some more Android Wolverine. Really, I think Sylvester's work on this series is incredible. I think the comics are good. The art is great. Uh, a really, uh, a high point for me anyway, for Wolverine. I think that run is uh, up there with, Great Wolverine runs. This is uh, the air. This is the Target Airboy, the Target colon Airboy number one from Eclipse. This is uh, Sam Keith. This is some mid '80s Sam Keith, 1987. Uh, even there, I mean, look at the backgrounds there. It's like Sam Keith, man, another guy who was just good from the get-go. Uh, beautiful. I love the composition. I love that the Airboy's face is in shadow. Just really well drawn. Uh, those very rights and esque back backgrounds, really, really great. No arguments there. I love this piece. Uh, this is uh, Gene Colan and it's by Klaus Janssen. This is a world's world's finest number two ninety seven Batman and Superman. Great. Uh, 19, 1983. Uh, Colan and Janssen, one of my favorite. Janssen. 
Jansen and Palmer and Alcala, probably my favorite inkers over Cohen. Uh, and yeah, that's a great example. Why? Uh, Michael Lark, the variant cover to Captain America number 12. This is from the Brubaker run of Captain America. Lark actually did some interior work on that series as well. Really beautiful, uh, somber, sort of very, very Captain America Captain America cover. But Lark is great. Big fan of his. I have been for a long time. Wonderful drawing. This is, uh, uh, Claudio Claudio Castellini from the Marvel vs. DC from the 90s. But this was, I think, Marvel and DC's first crossover in a long time. But some nice, some nice store, some nice store action from from uh, from the book and the pages in the series are kind of rare. So it's nice, nice to see that. Uh, the great, this is uh, Adi Granov. This is a variant cover from New Mutants number six from 2020. This is the uh, Dark Phoenix 40th anniversary variant cover, but it's big. You yes. get a sense of the scale of this painting, it's big. It's, uh, yeah, like 15 by 22, give or take. But yeah, really beautiful painting by Granov. Yeah, a really fabulous artist. Uh, Trying to get through some more. It's uh, a nice John Buscema romance flash. This is from Our Love Story number 16. 1972, uh, John Buscema and, and Joe Sinnott. But as I said, John Buscema could even draw romance comics pretty great. And that man truly was the Michelangelo of comics. <laughs> yeah, he definitely was. I mean, that was, uh, well, look at that. That's, it, that's yeah. It's, it's, it's really I, fantastic. It's a good it, it really is a great illustration. It's so, yeah. it's, wow. Then we move on to John's brother, Sal. Yep. On uh, Rampaging Hulk. So it's really great. I love these Sal Bissema Hulk pages with the gray tones from the magazines. This is the Hulk and Ant Man uh, from uh, Rampaging Hulk number nine. Uh, just, yeah, this is some of my favorite Sal Bissema work. This, uh, this stuff this is inked by Rudy Messina. And I, I love the gray tone pages. They're just, uh, it's a unique and wonderful. This is uh, a really nice page. You got uh, Ant Man and Thor on it. I mean, wow. Oh yeah, Thor. I forgot that Thor was on that page. So yeah. Oh, you, you, we skipped over this. this yes. Hanging uh, behind you the whole time. Uh, Alex Ross from the Superman Peace on Earth one shot. One of the. This was the first of the one shots that Ross did with Paul Dini. Uh, I am some of the best work that Ross ever did. I think that you know, for me. For Ross, it's you know Marvels and Kingdom Come, and then those Paul Dini one shots. I think, and this is a, a, a great one. I, I the Superman, you know, the, the whole, you know, every one of the every one of those one shots was sort of them tackling a real world problem. So in Superman Peace on Earth, it's, it's Superman tackling uh, hunger and specifically hunger in Africa. So here he is, you know, basically trying to save, doing what he can to save as many people as he can from you know the things that trouble people in Africa. So you've got, you know, Jacob's rescuing a bus of, of refugees from a bunch of lions and putting out a fire with a with a little tornado of water. And, and Ross, I mean, I don't know that, you know, that everybody knows. Ross, Ross is Ross. But this is, uh, I think it's a stunning piece. And it's framed really beautifully. So I hung it up. Very nice. Yeah, I didn't want to leave. I didn't want to forget about that one. It's uh I mean, it's been hanging out there all night, but it is in the auction. We have been staring uh, at it. More Superman. This is, uh, Superman. Uh, this is Stuart Immonen. This is uh, Action Comics number 758. This is from uh, 1999. Uh, great piece by Immonen. Uh, speaking of Superman, got some a few things come up. So I think people, the people who know, no, and the people who don't know should know that artwork from the uh, anything sort of around the death of Superman is incredibly difficult to get. Incre like there's a few collectors who really have basically a monopoly on that whole era of Superman artwork uh, and sort of related. So it's death of Superman, funeral for a friend, reign of, reign of the Superman, that whole era. Uh, it's it's very difficult. So we have here a couple pages from Rain. This is uh, Jan Jurgens from Superman 81. This is 
Cyborg Superman and Mongol. Uh, Cyborg Superman, I think, one of the coolest things that Dan Jurgens Jer ever created. O always cool looking. Isn't that great? Isn't that great profile. You can see through his face. <laughs> but yeah, these pages are very, very rare. Very, very. The, these are not parted with lightly. Uh, this is uh, Tom Grummet. This is Adventures of Superman 502. Uh, this is uh, an early appearance of Superboy, the, the new the new version of Superboy, who I think still has his own comic. Um, a, a very enduring character. Uh, yeah, early early page featuring Superboy. Really, I mean, again, these pages are not they're not uh, parted with lightly. And they are rarely parted with at all. So this is slightly after this is this is right after Superman comes back. So this is the sort of post reign of the Superman, but sort of early return of Superman. This is uh, you know he comes back with his mullet, Superman uh, fighting the Eradicator. This is by uh, Butch Geis. This is from Action Comics 693. So all these pages are 1993, 90, yeah, 1990. Three, so you know right, that whole death of Superman era is has become uh, sort of like a touchstone for like Superman and DC fans from that from that time period. It's like and that that sort of death of Superman and Batman Nightfall are sort of the defining storylines of that time period. And uh, that's the Nightfall page is coming up too. It's uh, Lady Death Vampirella by Stephen Hughes. It's, uh, more. Great Gene Colon, Gene Gene Colon Al, uh, Alcala, as I was saying, one of the best colon inkers. I mean, and you can see it. I mean, this page is stunning. It is beautiful. Uh, this is, uh, we have this is a complete story listed individually. So it's uh, Irv Novik. This is um, Batman number two thirty four. It's the Robin backup feature. So each page available for up for bidding separately, but all great Novik. Uh, this is uh, 1971. Yes. Seven page story, each page is available separately. And, uh, oh, that's, that's the last one. Uh, more Gene Cullen, Gene Cullen, Tom Palmer, Tomb of Dracula. This is uh, Tomb of Dracula number 53. Um, this is Iron Man by Herb Trimpey. Nice. Flying Around Iron Man by Trimpey. This is uh, 1976. So Mark Bagley. This is a variant cover from Heroes Reborn number four from 2021. This is the uh, Doctor Spectrum variant cover. Doctor Spectrum from the Squadron Supreme. Uh, this is interesting. This is this is, a, this is a, another complete story. 20 22 pages. Uh, two of the pages are photocopies. They are not included, but the copies are included. Uh, including this first page, uh, by Trevor Von Eden, written by Steve Engelhart. Uh, really great. Uh, Von Eden was great. So Von Eden, a really interesting career. He's like he, he he was around for a long time. He changed styles like on a whim, just sort of whatever suited him for the story he was telling, and was the uh, Von Eden was the first artist approach to draw Batman Year One. And, uh, and that would have been a really interesting uh, take if that had happened. And, you know, Batman Year One, you know, we all know Batman Year One turned into one of the most amazing comic books ever made, one of the most beautiful comic books ever made. And I, which is not a disservice to Von Eden. I think that if he had done it, it I think the story would have been equally good. It just would have been different. Uh, and it would have it's in, a, in an alternate reality, you know, Von Eden drew year one, and we could have seen what that looked like. But uh, I think this story is really great. It, it was an inventory story that was just never used. But but the lettering is on the board, so you can at least read it. Very nice. And another and complete story. <laughs> Jim Mooney, uh, Supergirl backup from uh, Action Comics number 304, 1963. Uh, Let's get through the rest as quickly as I can. Uh, Greg Capullo Spawn, uh, Greg Land, uh, uh, Batman No Man's Land, uh, Gilbert Hernandez, uh, Love and Rockets uh, title title page, the Love and Rockets number twenty three. 
uh, John Byrne, X-Men Hidden Years, Havoc, and X-Men Fun. Uh, page should also, yeah, uh, color, includes its color guide. Uh, Jim Woodring Frank page, the always always impressive Jim Woodring. Uh, uh, Ron Friend, a great Ron Friend store page, store 411. This is a uh, Kurt Swan. This is trust me, this is a double. This is Action Comics Weekly. So for those who remember Action Comics Weekly, every issue had a, a two-page spread of uh, Superman by Kurt Swan that was like serialized over the run of the series. So this is one of those. Uh, I'll, I'll Olivier Coipel, uh Thor, the beautiful Coipel is amazing. Uh, uh, John Salardo's uh, with Inspecting Coletta's the romance uh, Secret Hearts, uh, the romance title splash. Got a couple of uh, Jan Dursima X Men Unlimited pages, quality '90s X Men. Uh, so there's a couple of, speaking of Batman Nightfall, I got a couple of pages from Nightfall. This is post, post Batman getting his back broken. So that's Azrael as Batman basically hunting for Bane. Uh, he's no fan. And a Robin here trying to sort of rein in Azrael so he's not, doesn't kill a whole bunch of people. Uh, and here we have basically Bane here learning that somebody is running around as Batman and he's like, what's going on there? So you got some Bane, some, some, some Azrael as Batman. These, again, like Reign of the Superman and Death of Superman. Uh, incredibly hard to find these pages. This is Jim Aparo again. So this is uh, 1993. Really wonderful pages. Uh, more Greg Land Batman. This is a double, this is a double splash. Uh, it's, uh, Oxner again. This is a, it's a cover Young Love number 126. So Young Love 126 is the last issue of the series and really the last comic, uh, the last, ro last romance comic of the, of the romance era. It's sort of like, you know, this is 1977. The romance comics have slowly been petering out. And this was the last one. And, uh, it's kind of nice in that regard. It's like, it's, it's, it's a good one. It's in the Oxner again. Uh, and it's, you know, sort of the end of an era. Uh, another OAX guest, this is Dan Burton, just great painting of a bunch of Marvel characters, really fabulous. Yeah, Captain Marvel, Son of Satan, Iron Man. Uh, Killmonger, I want to say. Daredevil, Warlock, beautiful. Burton's great. Uh, only a few more, folks, only a few more, and then we can all go to bed. <laughs> uh, Lynn Mortimer, Spidey Super Stories. I love Win Mortimer. I love Spider Man. Kicking a guy. In, nice this is a guy named, uh, he's like Mr. Spots or the Spot or something like that. And he's basically trying to give everybody measles because it was the 70s and that's what people did. Thank Don't you, Gary. And I was right. Thank you, Brian. I've uh, got a bunch of what if pages. What if, this is what if number 21 by Gene Colan. What that's a what if, what if Invisible Girl married the Submariner. This is uh, What If number 13 uh, from the second series of What If. This is What If Professor X had, what if Professor X had become the juggernaut? Sure. <laughs> uh, I got What If number 13 from the second series again. Yeah, same story. Another great yes, X-Men characters. Uh, that's Art Germ, Art Germ drawing of a uh, character from My Hero Academia. Archer Originals, you know, we don't, you know, there aren't very many. David Mack, this is the cover to Neil Gaiman's North, Mytho North Mythology Number Four. Really beautiful work by Mack. Try it. Nobody, nobody paints prettier than David Mack. Uh, Saad Ribic is uh, from Thor, God of Thunder Number Five, it's, uh, 2013. Beautiful, printed from these pencils. In the book, they digitally colored over rib expenses. Uh, one other guy, just really fabulous artist. Um, and I, yeah, I think, I mean, there's some other things. That, I mean, honestly, just look at the auction. There's a, there's a lot. It's, it's, 
it's it's all it's, it's a quality auction. There's there's a lot of great stuff in it. I don't want to keep everybody too late. Um, but you can see by the amount of stuff that we had here, then you know that fact that we couldn't get through everything. We never get through everything. We never do. We got through a lot though tonight. The thing is, you have a lot of art in the uh, in this in this auction. And That's a good one. So if, if for anybody who came in late. Uh, so this is the the art session on Sunday as part of the John Burke collection Sunday uh, this coming Sunday starting at six six p.m. Eastern. There's uh you know eighteen or so pieces of art in the John Burke session. Go back and watch the beginning of the show if you missed it. And because uh, there's some really ugh, there's some good stuff. And then the regular art session Monday starting at a normal time starting at seven. Uh, I'll be here both sessions if anybody has any questions you can call me at the office uh we'll be at wondercon in a couple weeks i'm excited about it looking forward to wondercon i always love i always have a good time at that show so we'll be there lots of stuff for sale showing off a couple pieces from the next auction because this won't be over we got a killer already for the next auction like a really it's a killer it'll be on the wall of wondercon um it's right. special it's a piece that's uh it's from 1980 i believe it's from 1981 and the original was sold shortly after that by the artist, and it has never been for sale since. And not a known collector, so it's not even a piece that people know about. Uh, and I don't want to be on the wall in two weeks. So I'm gonna I'm gonna have some spies over at WonderCon. <laughs> Bill, I'll text you a picture of it after the show, Bill. All right, that, that <laughs> but I don't want I don't want to tell anybody what it is because I don't want anybody saving their money. I want them to bid in this auction. <laughs> uh, and you know. Nice. We do, we do, for the most part, we, we, we allow, you know, uh, generous time payments. Mm -hmm. Any questions about any time payments or, or, or paying, you know, you can, you can, you know, if you win stuff in the auction, you can consign stuff to the next one to, to pay for the, for your win. We want, I want people to get art that they want. I don't care if you have the money right now. <laughs> I want, I, I, as long as you pay for it eventually. I want people to get things that they like. That's the fun part about doing this is the connecting people with things that they love. Uh, and not, you know, and I, I guess sometimes people need to move things around and I totally understand and I'll work with anybody uh, to the best of my ability. So no. any questions about anything in this auction, uh, my email is basically my name as it appears on the screen, just with an at symbol in between the, and the letter S and then an at symbol. Uh, so Micah S at ConnellConnect.com. If you have any questions about anything you've seen here about time payment possibilities or any other things or consignments uh, I'm around, we're, yeah, again, we'll be at WonderCon in a couple weeks. Uh, then I think I get like a month off of conventions. I'm kind of excited about that. <laughs> now, for as far as the time payments and potential consignments to cover payments, that you, you prefer people would bring that up before the uh, uh, ideally, the yeah. ideally um, but not I mean time so there are certain things that are list like on some of the more higher higher valued things if time payments are uh, are being accepted it'll say in the listing that time payments are accepted and on less valuable pieces you feel free to contact me if it's an issue and uh, I'm happy to do everything I can if, if you know or if it means, you know, it's like, hey, if I bid on this, then we can sign stuff. I'm more than happy to. It's mm -hmm. less work for me later because I've already, you know, having stuff coming in. Great. Great. <laughs> uh, and thanks, everybody, for sticking through another another marathon, uh, another marathon show. One last question for you, though. How yeah. did you get the nickname Mr. Sunshine? It's an excellent question. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I I, Vince is always telling me to smile more in my when we do videos, mm, and right. um, we're not always cheery as as uh, as, as Vince is all the time. But, Vince uh, is high energy. He, he is high be, energy. He's and, Mr. And, and Solar that's great. Player. That's great. And I'm not saying that he's wrong. <laughs> no, no, but uh, you know, sometimes. Hmm. Also, I, I would let say everybody know that I did this show mildly sick. So exactly, yes, any, any un, uh, unnecessary rambling or mm -hmm. or if I at any point looked like I was going to pass out, <laughs> that is why. I would have switched to a commercial, like uh, <laughs> and call and dialed your phone. 
<laughs> Thanks again for hosting us. No, Phil, not a always, problem. Always fun. Fun. Nice, yep. nice to see you. And uh, we'll have fun. So you can uh, find my signature on that poster time. behind you. What's oh that one? <laughs> yeah, I I have to go to like Hobby Lobby and buy uh you know the two by three foot frames. <laughs> I've got because I got all three posters and I I've, I've just been moving them around my room the last month. So they got to go. They they're not going to go on the wall in here, but I think I'll put them in the main house somewhere. But uh, but yeah, thank you, Mike. Uh, as always, for, especially for toughing it out with the cold and everything. Uh, no, you know, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks to everybody for watching. And um, yeah, again, if you missed the beginning, go back and watch because the. There's some great stuff at the beginning, and um, you can watch Bill and I ramble about OAX for like 15 minutes. That's why we ran late. Blame Bill. We ran late because right. we were talking about how good a show he put on. I got it. We got to stop talking about <laughs> OAX. Uh, all right, Micah. Well, thank you for doing it. Everybody in the chat, thanks for hanging out with us as always, and uh, have a wonderful evening. We'll see you again tomorrow night on an episode of Dueling Dealers.